I'd like to introduce our panel of experts. So let's go ahead and meet this group. So first, um, we have Jack Margison, who is the VP of Global Alliances at DePosco, an end-to-end -end supply chain fulfillment solution. Hey, Jack. Uh, Scott Chamberlain is the Director of New Business Development at J Group, a third-generation family-owned 3PL. Hey, Scott. Kelly Francisquino is a business systems analyst at Fosdick Fulfillment, a 3PL that ships over 20 million direct to consumer orders. Um, sorry, direct to consumer and retail orders every year. Welcome, Kelly. And finally, Tony Thrasher is a senior director of product management at SPS Commerce, and he will be guiding today's discussion. Hey, Tony. So with that, I'm going to hand the conversation over to Tony. So Tony, take it away. Excellent. Thanks, Wes. And Thanks to all the attendees and then ahead of time, Scott, Kelly, and Jack for the, the insights and the time from you as well. So um, just a little bit more letting you all tell your story. I'm just going to ask you to kind of introduce yourself, introduce your company and, and your expertise. So uh, Jack, go ahead uh, first in terms of introductions. Sounds good. Thanks, Tony. <clears throat> hey, everybody. My name is Jack Margison. Uh, as mentioned, I'm the VP of Alliances here at the POSCO, really focusing on our strategic partner program. Uh, building those out. Uh, you know, DePosco is an end-to-end -end supply chain technology provider, as we mentioned, uh, really focused on warehouse and order management uh, and providing that software, have a primary focus on 3PL. So very excited to have the conversation here today. Great. Thanks, Jack. And then Kelly, how about you and, and Fosdick? Hi, everyone. Uh, Kelly Francis Kino from Fosdick. Um, I've been with the company for 22 years. Um, the business and, uh, business and retail analyst here at Fosdick. Fosdick is a uh, family-owned business, started in 1965, um, where we started with 15,000 square feet and now bi-coastal with uh, locations in Nevada, here, uh, Connecticut, and even in uh, Canada. We encompass 2.3 million square feet. And as mentioned by Wes earlier, we ship 20 million direct-to-consumer or retail order packages a year. Excellent. And then uh, Scott, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and J-Group. Sure. Hi, everybody. Thanks for the opportunity to, to be on the panel today. My name is Scott Chamberlain. I'm Director of Business Development for the J-Group. And uh, J-Group is a 3PL, also founded in 1965. So we've got some, some two great 3PLs on the call today. Uh, Family-owned uh, with three facilities across the U.S. providing advanced fulfillment to our clients in the D2C and B2B space. Excellent. All right. Well, let's let's jump right in. Uh, thank you all for those introductions. Uh, so, Jack, I'm going to I'm going to start with you on this one. Uh, let's start with the, the warehouse management system. So WMS, just speak a little bit in terms of broad terms, the criticality of that system uh, to successful operations and, and what what you see as you know components and characteristics of a really strong WMS system. Yeah, happy to. Um, you know, as as I mentioned, we do provide WMS. I'm going to try and speak to this in less of a pitchy manner and 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 speak for it broadly. And as we think about it, you know, 3PLs, what's the primary focus? Warehousing and distribution as a service on that end. And if you're taking in people's inventory, you're consuming that, you're managing that, and you're you're fulfilling on that promise that that brand's making, that WMS needs to be that spinal cord, that backbone of the operation. Uh, the inventory accuracy, inventory levels are the fundamental pieces to being able to drive more advanced automation, uh, more integration, and more of that technology or technological differentiation that 3PLs are really relying on right now to move ahead in the market. Uh, I would say, you know, as we look, though, that is the most critical component and the keys to one of those modern WMSs that you were mentioning, we'll touch on this more, is really that ability to be connected out to different technology stacks, different uh, you know order sources and more there. So I, I would say, as you think about a 3PL, you think about scaling, that needs to be the first area you focus on um, because that is you know that core data set off which all other automation can operate. Excellent. And then Kelly, Scott, I'll, I'll ask you both the same question, but maybe start with you, Kelly. Would sure. you mind sharing just a little bit of your, 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 w, your WMS journey um, and then also just kind of how you equate the importance of that WMS system to the success of your business. Sure. Uh, so first off, I think that a uh, real good WMS is a tier one cloud-based system with access to data, analytical reporting to run the business. 
with seamless integrations um, as a 3PL, allowing customers to connect to other vendors and partners in a timely fashion is critical, especially in today's world. Um, you know, now more than ever, clients want things done yesterday. I think we've all kind of been in that position. So um, additionally, customization is key to a 3PL industry. You know, so having flexibility to, um, to dynamically change within a WMS is a major, major value. And what we pride ourselves in being able to grow and change with our customers um, on the fly and as they need to. Great. And Scott, how about for you in terms of your journey and how you look at the WMS system? Yeah, very similar. So from the sales perspective, which is where my responsibilities lie with my company, it's important that what I'm selling is backed up by what we can actually do. And the backbone of that, which uh, the term Jack uses often, uh, is the WMS. And so that WMS, to build off of what Kelly just shared, drives everything that we do, visibility, customization, inventory management, and so forth for our clients. And so just as it's difficult to scale a segmented supply chain, it's difficult to scale pretty much anything that's segmented. So that WMS helps pull all that in together for us internally at J Group and provide the experience not only our customers want, but that their end consumers want as well. Great. And then, you know, Kel Kelly and Scott, you know, are there specific <laughs> investments into those core WMS capabilities that you guys are either maybe making soon or made made recently that you could expand on? Just kind of like what's the climate of some of the, uh, you know, improvements or investments that you're making into that that backbone? Yeah, well, uh, coincidentally, we are actually in the in the process of migrating over to a Deposco WMS based system. So um, we're migrating clients over now. We still have some on the old WMS and on our homegrown system, and some into the Deposco system. So um, we're definitely that's where we see the the future to be was in that cloud based system. How about on your side, Scott? Yeah, J Group. Um migrated over to a tier one WMS about 12 to 15 years ago. I think it has been now. So uh, a lot of that core infrastructure is there for us, but we're adding on to that right now is investments in the ability to extract that data and information and present that to our clients in a more enhanced proactive approach so that they can, in some cases make decisions themselves, but also that we can make decisions for them based off of the data and the analytics that's driving out of the WMS. Excellent, I know Wes in the open and just even like the titling this webinar, we also bring in the kind of people and process complementary side of, of that WMS. And I, I know Kelly, you guys have made some improvements mm -hmm. and plan to make some improvements on that side, but I'll open it up to all three of you in terms of connecting the dots a little bit between the WMS and the system, as well as the process and people that execute within, the, uh, within that system. So Kelly, yeah. why, why, don't you go, why don't you go first, if you wouldn't mind, just speak a little bit of uh, some of your experiences there. Well, so we've uh, we've all found a dynamic, you know, change already with one of the with the deployment of Deposco's, you know, before we were picking off paper, and you know, you relied on the picker to go to the right location and back and forth, and you know track, go back through steps. But now with the Deposco uh, process, we have the ability to pick and put seven, as many as 70 orders onto a cart, walking that pick path once. So, you know, it's a lot less taxing on the person, on the people, um, you know, and much more efficient um, in that regard. Nice. Yeah, I'd add to that and just say that a good WMS, I think, provides a good human-centric work design because so much of what we still do, although there's the influence of robotics and so forth into the industry, is centered around labor, and labor has been a, a touchy subject for the industry. I think over 50-some percent of uh, supply chain you know, personnel are suggesting that it's just difficult to reach you know, the right talent and, and maintain them. So having that WMS that helps drive that experience for our team in an easy to use, um, pretty self-explanatory way is key to keep to, as part of keeping them in their positions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I would add on to what Scott and Kelly have said. I couldn't agree more there in, in, in two particular areas. You know, Kelly talked to the benefits of moving over to these tier one, moving over to these advanced WMSs. 
you're able to automate a lot of those traditionally manual processes and really bring them in. So instead of walking that path 70 times, you can walk it one time and, and, and really bash that and move that through. Uh, you know, Scott was talking about the labor side of it as well. Labor has been increasingly scarce, harder to find. And so one of the keys there is making sure that whatever system you're operating and you're running your operations off of it is really tailored to the individual user that's using it. So a head of IT is going to need to have a very different experience than a warehouse worker uh, who's on that picking staff or who's on that packing staff. So really designing it for purpose for each one of those and simplifying that so you don't have to find the very technical labor, that very advanced labor, but really letting that software cover that advanced knowledge for you is it's really key in today's market, especially with the labor fluctuations that are going on. That's a great point. I'm going to, Jack, I'm going to, you know, mind put you on the spot on something that Kelly, kind of riffing off something Kelly said. Uh, Kelly, you mentioned the customizations, maybe like the personalization type stuff. I think, Jack, knowing that you're a, a WMS provider that I'm going to assume you don't want to go too crazy on the customizations, but you're balancing a, a need across your customer base related to WMS customizations. Uh, can you riff on a little bit of that comment from, from yeah. Kelly and how you guys approach it at the POSCO? Yeah, and this is one of those keys, you know, Ke Kelly mentioned a cloud-based system. I uh, mentioned that tier one system. I've mentioned the word agility here. Uh, when you look at software, you, there's always a balance of customization for con versus configuration. So whatever platform you're on, you want to make sure that you can make adjustments rapidly within it, that you can make those changes, that you can provide the unique experience. As we look, 3PLs don't service one type of customers. And Kelly and Scott have just mentioned they have retail customers, they have direct consumer customers. Some of the differentiation in direct to consumer is maybe it's personalized branding, messaging that comes out, branding on the boxes. These are key things that you're going to need to support if you want to attract those businesses. And if your core technology stack can't be flexible to either adopt a new type of printer that's for a unique subscription service or uh, adopt a different type of packing, um, and you have to customize that very, very quickly every time, you're going to be stuck with a lot of technical debt whenever you want to update that. So whatever platform you go to, you want to make sure that it gives you the flexibility to be able to pivot very rapidly, that you can do customizations to a point, but also that it's very configurable on that end. So you don't have to rely on hard coding. You don't have to rely on these changes that can can then bite you as the platform evolves over time. So I think it's a healthy balance uh, because ultimately 3PLs are in service of the clients that they're trying to secure and fulfill on behalf of. So you need to make sure that your platform, whatever it is that you're using, can serve those clients' needs as well, not just today, but three years from now, five years from now, because changing out these technologies is not frequent and it's not simple. So you want to make sure you've got one that's right for now and for the future. I think that's great. I think it's a great topic, you know, call it customization, call it flexibility in configuration, whatever that may be, but that's, that's great. Thank you for that. So I'm going to shift gears slightly uh, and uh, open this up to you three in different lens, but um, we talked about some of those supporting systems or capabilities that's kind of surround the WMS that are also critically important. Um, maybe start with you, Jack, and then Kelly and Scott. I'll ask for you to add some color in terms of experiences that you've seen firsthand in those areas. But Jack, what are some of those kind of peripheral systems that complement the WMS that that you see as mission critical as well? Yeah, and, and that's a great question because we've talked about that four walls of the warehouse, but 3PLs are servicing multiple brands, multiple clients, multiple retail channels, online channels, and more. And typically, as in the case with both Fosdick and J Group, with multiple locations. So the first thing that I would look at and, and, and the key in today's real market is connectivity. So an uh, order management layer, whether that's native to the WMS platform or whether that's uh, separate, uh, um, order management is critical. How do you automate those traditionally manual decisions around routing, around fulfillment, whether to split a shipment or not split a shipment, time to delivery and more. Having the intelligence to automate those decisions is as important when you look at these kind of customer experiences as, a, as anything else. And I think secondarily, it's the ability to integrate. So whether you're using an integration platform, whether that WMS or OMS has native integrations within, these clients want to be onboarded quickly. They want to be onboarded effectively. 
and they want to know that this isn't a one-off that you're having to support, you're having to build. So that ability to integrate is, is as critical as your ability to manage their inventory because you have to be able to send those updates to their order sources, get back to their ERPs and more. So I would say as we look at peripheral layers and, and the ability to scale, uh, order management with some element of distributed order management and an integration layer are, are really critical for the 3PL uh, to, to bring those new clients on and, and ship effectively. Excellent. And, and Scott, how about you in terms of your, your experience in, in those domains or other peripheral systems that you, you guys have that complement your WMS core? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a great question. I think Jack touched on the absolute core um, you know, peripheral platforms that you, you would integrate on that transportation management do that as well. Um, but outside of that, kind of building on the customization and personalization aspect of it too, there are so many of these other platforms and programs and plugins, if you will, that offer this level of customer experience to the end consumer, whether that's in some form of design change with the packaging or branded print on demand insert, or it's just the overall experience that they offer in their packaging with a box inside of a box inside of a box. Um, that WM has to, to be the foundation to be able to integrate with all of those, those kind of um, competing interests, if you will, across every customer. It's no longer a differentiation between 3PL to 3PL. The differentiation is now all the way down to the order level. It's differentiated from order to order. So the WMS has to pivot literally from order to order with the, all these different peripheral platforms. So I did, I did trans order management and, and intelligence and um, data analytics uh, that we're plugging into WM as well, uh, transportation, and then all the personalized, personalized uh, platforms that we've introduced. I'm gonna yeah, it, I love that. Oh, sorry. sorry no, no. Now I, I was going to say, going it, off it, of, uh, you know, Jack and, and uh, Scott there, I mean, one other piece, speaking operationally, um, is like labor management system right? Also known as LMS to help track employees' performances so that in the warehouse, um, enter goals based on the scans, picks, steps. Um, it's a great tool to ensure that you're profitable um, um, for the client and for your customer and for yourself. Um, pick and pack scanning. Um, although we haven't yet to dive into it, somebody mentioned before robotics. I mean, there's certainly the upcoming trend. A uh, couple people from our organization were just at ProMat this year, and, and half the show was robots picking, packing, and unloading containers. So, you know, is that the, it's the future? You know, like I said, we're not we're not there yet, um, but it's 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 inevitable. I think at some point. Yeah, that's that's excellent. I think you know, covering a lot of ground there. Uh, distributed order management robotics, labor management, to your point, Scott, some of the, some of the packaging, pick pack, all that kind of stuff. So uh, excellent. I'm going to shift us gears just slightly now to talk a little bit more about, okay, so we just talked a lot about, about a great cohesive technology stack. That's all working together. We're all, you know, butterflies and rainbows. So now the question is, I'm going to throw this to Scott and Kelly for some firsthand experience. What are some of the uh, ramifications of either not having an effective WMS, not having those complementary systems that you, you've you experienced firsthand. Kelly, how about you? So I think I mentioned earlier about our, you know, our kickoff with DePosco and tra the transitioning of picking orders, uh, but also just from a inventory control standpoint, like we, you know, there's greater inventory control, um, accuracy, and, and, we touched on this earlier too about the turnaround time. So significantly faster integrations. Um, you know, if you can't keep up with the demand or with everybody else, you know, you're going to find yourself at the end of the line there. So the ability to pull data through many means and quickly. Um, so it's, that's key. And then going back to, you know, what the client, you know, their inventory, like if that's, that's, you know, what their bread and butter is, right? You need, so the greater inventory controls and getting their customer orders out timely and accurately. Excellent. Scott, how about you in terms of some, you know, maybe pain that you've seen or that you felt when, when maybe the technology isn't up to snuff? Yeah, um, I think one of the, I think one of the per peripheral add-ons that we, we failed to mention here too is probably one of our sponsors, SPS. So forgive me for not, throwing that out there because that's kind of the, the involvement I have here is that 
um, you know, n not necessarily pain, but, you know, as Jack and Kelly have alluded to, you know, growth, growth comes from every direction. And when your clients are ready to scale, um, you know, they're not going to wait for you to see if you can scale with them too. So, you know, part of that uh, growth that we have seen where the majority of our business and our clients has been direct to consumer, you know, e-commerce fulfillment, that shift back to traditional retail and, and, and the growth in that segment for us, um, you know, we, we have always done B2B, but did not have the, the systems necessarily like an SPS in place that would drive systematically um, some of those processes and our team picked it up uh, on the back end seamlessly, but it requires a lot more of a manual touch that so we refer to it more of an exception process where there's a lot more manual intervention, um, which certainly you know drives costs internally because you're now managing more of a human touch around simple processes, but without the solutions like an SPS, for example, in place that can drive the connectivity uh, more systematically, um, you know, it can create some pain. Excellent. And Scott, you, you mentioned earlier in the conversation when we were talking about the, some of the future investments or current investments you're making from that, that visibility with your client and, and how the WMS and those systems can enable that. What's the, what's the pain that, that got you to the point of needing to make that investment? Like what was the, um, so I don't think it was a, a great question. So I don't think it was necessarily a pain. So J Group's making a sizable uh, investment uh, over a million dollars into just data warehousing, data analytics. Um, and the reason being is we believe that that's the future of the, the fulfillment industry, the 3PL logistics industry, is to be ahead of those drivers and kind of feed or serve up to our clients um, you know what they may know, but or or may just misrepresent uh, based off of some assumptions that they have. So, um, you know those that's really what has driven some of that you know investment this coming year for us is to just be ahead of it. I think we've done a really good job of offering a little bit more than the foundational uh, analytics around just productivity and on time shipping and standard SLAs, but it's really just the, kind of the meat of uh, understanding their business the way that they look at it and providing that analytics back to them in a way that's easily to di easy to digest, right? Not everybody's a, a rocket scientist. I, I certainly am not. So. Looking, collaborating on the same information. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. And Jack, I want to get your perspective on this thread too. Uh, you're, you're seeing clients that are going through WMS transition real time they're sure I'm, they're coming to you with things that previously were working well, things that that weren't that they want to make sure is top of mind for you and your teams. Like, can you just kind of speak a little bit more broadly around that, that, you know, what goes wrong when you don't have the strong WMS and peripheral systems in place? Sure. Um, you know, I think, first of all, before we talk about the 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 processes that may be missing or the technical infrastructure, we think about that client side and we all know the direct to consumer demand right now is unwavering. Direct to consumer have high expectations. They mentioned we wanted it yesterday. That's the demand and they're only increasing. And this has been going on for years. COVID really put an accelerator onto that where people were saying, I need it. I don't want to talk to anybody. I want it at my front door yesterday and, and, and that's it. Um, a lot of the business to business world is shifting in that way as well. If that's the demand from the end consumer, that's going to be the demand of the clients of a 3PL as well. Hey, this is what we, we need to offer to stay competitive. And this is what we need to look at. So I think the pains that we see are really twofold. One, what are the consumer demands that the legacy technology stacks, the legacy systems, the legacy approaches can't meet? That's a big one. Um, you know, Scott and Kelly both mentioned that as we talk about the vis visibility, as we talk about that level of access. So think about what a direct to consumer expect, or you know, a consumer online expects from their visibility from the mm -hmm. uh, a, a brand or a retailer, an e-commerce vendor is going to want that same level of visibility, if not more. So the ability to connect to those or not connect to those end client systems is really preventative to being selected as that three PL of choice. If you can't provide that right now, they're not going to go with you. They're going to go with somebody like Fosdick. They're going to go with somebody like J Group who can provide you as the customer of that 3PL, that visibility and that experience. So 
the inability to onboard new clients because their technology stack is not competitive. Because as we mentioned earlier, what worked in 2019 doesn't work now. What worked in 2020 doesn't work now, and it's going to continue to change. So that's a big one. We also see on the other side of it is, and that's the ability to attract new customers, but the ability to retain existing customers. Um, if you run into this manual process, you're running manual processes, you're running disconnected systems, you're inviting the error and the and the inherent risk of human error there. And the recovery time and the time where if you do have an incident, you have an issue where you overship, you miss the shipment, something of the sort there, then you have to manually intervene. So what should be a very connected, very quick, hey, here's your inventory, here's your orders, here's your report that Scott was talking to. And oh, if something went wrong, here's that root cause, here's the audit log. Without doing that, you really damage your customer experience as well. So it's going to be harder to retain those existing customers. So when we see a lot of these technical challenges, the, the real pain that the 3PL experiences that we've seen is on the ability to attract or retain. If you're outside of SLA, if you're missing orders, you're having to go chase through the warehouse, or you're reliant on a couple of very seasoned warehouse workers who've been there forever and don't have time to train anybody, that's a very difficult mindset to break out of. And it's a very difficult ecosystem in which to serve that customer truly. It's excellent. It's excellent. Um, Scott, one, one of the topics that 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 came up when you and I chatted prior to this was, I think you were coining the term, you know, hybrid 3PL. And you alluded to it a yeah. couple of months ago in terms of some of the transitions at, at J Group. Can you... can can you talk about that concept more broadly for the, for the attendees, but then also equate that to uh, the evolution in the tech stack between traditional wholesale versus traditional direct to commerce and how hybrid sits in the middle of those two? Yeah, so I think, uh, great point. I forgot about that conversation. And I think it stands true and we'll, we'll see. And if any of the listeners disagree, we'll see. But I think, you know, at, at the core, there's, and I think this goes across any industry realistically, but there are those 3PLs out there that are going to be at their core lead with the services around DTC, e-commerce fulfillment. And there are going to be those 3PLs out there that lead at their core with those, those foundational B2B uh, service levels. Although there's going to be those hybrid 3PLs, I think Fosdick and J Group fall into that uh, to a degree, maybe from different perspectives, quite honestly. Uh, or at least coming into that area from different angles. I think, and Kelly, correct me, I think we're coming at it from a D2C to B2B. I think you're more heavily direct response B2B into D2C. Uh, and so that hybrid starts to evolve. And so the WMF acts as that backbone, that core to help support that. But at the end of the day, that hybrid and the way that their facilities are capitalized will still have some limitations, right? We'll never be full B2B you know, giant, you know, uh, outbound staging truckloads and so forth, because our facilities just aren't capitalized that way. But our WMS allows us to support B2B, um, you know, with some scale and volume, um, you know, relatively easy because of its capabilities and, and the Pocos capabilities has that as well. Um, so I think that's, correct me if I'm wrong, I think that's where you're, you're, you're picking up on yesterday, but yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And even just like earlier when we were talking about, we were so centered on or talking about technology and peripheral systems, but you just mentioned facilities, the facilities in the WMS and how that all plays into your overall strategy. I think that's a great sure. point. Of, yeah. Kelly, Jack, anything anything to add on that kind of hybrid thing uh, from, from your perspectives? And, and maybe Jack, like I'm sure you're making even road mapping decisions and investment decisions. And same with you, Kelly, in terms of needing X for D to C versus Y for kind of more traditional wholesale and any comments to add there? Uh, sure. And I guess I'll, I'll kind of go first there. The last few years have seen explosive growth around direct to consumer, but what we're also seeing is a shift back towards retailers. We're seeing e-com native brands going to retail. We're seeing these. And, and one thing that I think it would be short-sighted to do is say, you know, DePosco is going to build towards B2C because that's where we're seeing the market going, or we're going to build towards B2B because that's where we're, we're seeing the market going. Reality is the market's been incredibly hard to predict. We had COVID, then we had the supply chain contractions, the congestions of the port. 
you, you can't plan for one strategy, it, it, whether you're a software provider like we are who's building the roadmap or whether you're a 3PL who's investing in your roadmap of your technology stack. You need to be able to prepare for both. And, and, and like Scott said, you have to look at how you've capitalized your existing real estate right now. And then as you grow and scale, if you see a demand uptick and you're saying, hey, we're doing really good at this retail thing, maybe we need to build out a little bit more space. It's designed for pallet in, pallet out versus these you know, fast moving slotted areas for direct to consumer. Um, but I think as we look ahead at the future of retail, uh, it's unclear of where it's going. And I don't think one or the other are going to become the dominant player. And I think we have to prepare for that. And how do you prepare? It's you know, how do you segment your inventory digitally out, but you can physically group it to really make the most use of that existing space. So instead of saying, well, I've got, you know, my customer X has a thousand items that we're storing for them. They want to put a hundred onto Shopify, 500 onto Amazon and 500 into their retail. You need, and, and you have to physically group those. You should be able to physically group those together and digitally allocate that. So it's about looking at your technology stack to make the most of not only your labor, like we talked about earlier, but also your, your uh, fixed assets and your land and your real estate there as well. And, and planning for the unplanned, because as a 3PL, if you get that big customer on the line, who's going to be really transformative for you, you want to make sure that your technology stack and that your processes and that your facilities can all support the demands that they're going to bring to the table and allow you to grow. Yeah, and to that, Jack, I mean, I think, you know, and then Scott brought on it too, it's the, it, we talked about it earlier, the flexibility. So like, I know our warehouse layouts are constantly changing, right? Because of the demand. It's like, you know, is it retail this quarter? And then it's going to be direct to consumer and it's based on client churn and their business changes and business needs. I mean, and we also have the ability to, you know, to get more space. Like if we don't have enough building, we, you know, we'll look for another building. And it's just, you know, to be able to, to be flexible and just go with the, go with the business, go with the flow. Um, you know, cause to your point, you don't know, is it, is it direct to consumer or is it retail? I, it, it could be either way, but I know our warehouses are constantly changing footprint and things. Every time I go into a warehouse, something's different and the client has moved around and based on growth. And so ties back to flexibility and having the technology to support it um, and a strong WMS, OMS to support it as well. Yeah, that's excellent. So after teeing you all up to, to answer a question about flexibility and unpredictability, now we're going to go to the crystal ball uh, portion of today's uh, program, just putting you all on the spot to try to make some predictions, uh, if you will. So just looking forward on just today's conversation, you know, we've talked about the WMS system, peripheral systems, how that plays in with the people in the process and the facilities, et cetera. You know, if we if we are looking three to five years out um, inside of those systems, what do you where do you where do you see uh, this area going? What do you think are some of the big investments that 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 are going to really power the next generation, if you will, of a WMS system or these tech stacks for for us as three PLs? So um, maybe Scott, I'll start I'll start with you uh, on this one, and then we'll go uh, to Kelly and Jack. Yeah, I think the future lies in four key areas. I think commercial innovation, right? So at the warehouse level, your investment in the robotics and the technology and the, the equipment that uh, manages both labor and efficiency appropriately and, and just, you know, cuts out the, the turn. I think sustainable operations, right? I think it's one thing we, we didn't touch on in, in too much detail, but I know the team is fully behind it, is that uh, you know, sustainability, both not only in your just operational processes year after year, but sustainability and what more and more brands realize it as is we are, what are your green initiatives? How are you cutting your carbon footprints? How are you managing supplies and waste? Um, I think real-time decision execution, we talked a lot about that too, right? The speed to be able to be flexible and to integrate and to make decisions uh, on the floor in real time uh, will be key not only to be a competitive 3PL, but it'll be key for our clients to just be competitive with their consumers. And I think that human-centric kind of work design, you know, that the that a good WMS provides, um, because at the end of the day, you know, we, we're, you know, uh, we're all a team internally. We're all humans, right? And you want it to be a great work environment. You want people to want to come to work. And uh, the less hurdles, the less delays you could put into that, 
uh, and make them feel welcomed and they can get in and get out, uh, the better. That was my, my short, long question, answer. Awesome. Kelly, how about you? Same question. Uh, for all from business trends, I mean, we definitely do see uh, brands going into, re into the retail space before the DTC side. Um, certainly that wasn't the position 10 years ago. Um, you know, customers work so hard to, to get that customer, but we also see that the pushback is to, to retail first and they capture them there and then they drive off and then go to that dot com and to get the additional order, additional buy. But initially it's we, we see from, you know, that business perspective is that retail business is growing before the direct consumer. Um, so, you know, that's uh, and again. I think one thing I didn't touch upon is it goes back to the a little bit of the inefficiencies before I don't mean to backtrack, but you know, the inefficiencies on the on the wholesale retail side, we were doing all that homegrown in-house. And now we've realized that's not our core. Our core is to ship the orders uh, accurately, get the WMS to support it. And that's by partnering with the Deposco and the SPS, because those are your specialties. Our specialty is to pick, pack, and ship accurately and, and get our uh our orders out the door um, for our customers. So, um, but definitely the, as far as trends, the, uh, the retail business I, we see is uh, going forefront of the direct consumer side. Yeah. Well, I, if I could add one, uh, sorry, Jack, just for, just touch on one thing too, because I know it, it is an important uh, area of growth. And I think it's, it is part of the demand both now and it will continue to be over the next three, four or five years is customer service. Right. And so everything that we discussed about today is ultimately contributes to a better customer experience. Um, so I want to make sure we defined that one. That's a great one. Yeah. yeah. And I think as I look and, and I kind of see what what I'm hearing and, and what we're looking forward and, and looking at the crystal ball, I think both uh, Scott and Kelly both touched on it. And <clears throat> as you think about, you know, kind of what do we do? Kelly made a point of you know, we had it built homegrown, it was working, we could do it, but we decided that's not what we're best at. That's not our, our, our you know, kind of true north there. So they partnered in that sense. Uh, you know, Scott and the J group did that previously as well. I think as we think about that and, and we look at the decision of these retailers, we look at the decision of these brands to go to a 3PL, the reason they're partnering with you is because they understand that you know this space, you're great at this space, you can provide that level of service that they're expecting. And they don't want to take that that on internally, or maybe they want to take on part of that. So I think as we look forward, and, and, and Scott mentioned that service side of it, as we look forward, that's where I see a lot of this coming. The interconnected in real time where they can feed you that inventory, that order information with confidence, knowing that their ERP, their accounting system is going to be updated in real time. But then they're going to lean on the 3PLs for that expertise. And so I think it's going to start coming in terms of those data analytics and insights. Hey, here's what we're seeing. And go beyond that into maybe helping that customer with demand planning, with inventory planning and forecasting, so that you as a 3PL have a better understanding of what your facility capacity is going to look like 12 months from now. That client also has that better understanding. But as I think about the, the levels of service that could be provided, by 3PL, whether it's data insights, whether it's that, it, you know, at the core this year and, and it, in these next few years, the fulfillment execution, that optimization is always going to be top of mind. And I don't think that's ever going away. But how can the 3PL become a stronger partner by providing information and insights that that retailer brand didn't know? And, and Scott made a point earlier where they're making that investment and it's not a pain point right now. And why would we make that investment? I think very similarly, this isn't a pain point, but it's a gap. Yeah. And the yeah. work that Fosdick's doing, the work that J Group's doing <clears throat> forward ahead um, is going to differentiate them significantly in that. So I think it's all about that service to the customer because ultimately, whether you're 3PL, whether you're a software provider like we are, if you're not ultimately in that service mindset and helping them do their core business better, then you're at a disconnect from why you've partnered in the first place. That's great. Yeah, thank, th I mean, thank you very much. Insights on all three. I'd, just a couple quick follow-ups to some of those remarks. Scott, you mentioned the sustainability angle, which we hadn't gotten into in any of the previous questions. Uh, can you expand on, on what that means to, to J Group? And maybe I feel like when we 
we've spoken in the past, like that's an area where you guys are maybe uh, ahead of the game on some of the aspects there. Yeah, we, I feel like Gable, or excuse me, sorry, uh, J Group hasn't done a real good job promoting what we've done early on. And I think it's just because it wasn't something we we felt, you know, needed to be out there. Uh, but when we built our core facility here on the, in, on the East Coast in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, we, uh, we built it with just, you know, waste in mind. So, you know, our, our lighting throughout our facility is all uh, motions activated so that, you know, in areas that were not active, uh, those lights are turning off or saving energy. Uh, we've converted uh, a good portion of our, our lighting in our, in our parking lots and so forth or over to more energy efficient lighting. We have uh, uh, thermal heat wells underneath our facility uh, to, to drive, um, you know, the heat and control in the building, narrow aisles and so forth. It, it investments in uh, solar panels on the roof potentially coming here and being evaluated. Um, you know, it's, it's something that we've done, but I think more and more of our customers want it now, right? It's, it's kind of a prerequisite in some cases to even, uh, to even be vetted. Uh, all the way down to just the simple stuff, removing plastic from the, the pick and pack process, you know, and so forth. So um, I think we've made some, we made some early, very early and strong investment, and we continue to kind of reevaluate that and say, hey, what more can we do? Um, not only for our customers, but just because we got to make sure that everything is left better for everybody that comes with behind us i'll be 40 this year i've got two young kids i never cared about it to be completely honest but now i do i, do. I really i really do it's crazy it's, it's crazy how you just kind of make that shift so yeah so again i just want to i want to thank all three of you scott you know kelly jack i you know love the insights great to get to know you through the process but you know you all bring unique and valuable insights to the to the attendees um, I do. I want to just before we go back to Wes for wrap and then Q and A. I know we've got some questions from the attendees that they have for you for for you all. But uh, if you if any of you have closing remarks or anything you'd you'd like to just kind of real quick wrap on, I'd like to give you that forum too. Uh, so on my end, I, I you know I really appreciate you hosting us. Uh, you know, working alongside Scott and Kelly in this has, has been very exciting. I think all of us like to look forward, um, like to look at what's ahead. You know, Tony, Wes, and team. Uh, these are the kind of conversations that I think should be had more. What does the customer want? What does the industry need to do? How do we all need to prepare and and move forward in that? So I think there's a lot of change. We've talked about. We've been through some pretty uh, tectonic shifts in our industry and in our space over the last three years. And I, I think that's going to continue to happen. And the rate of change is going to pick up as you see uh, new technologies, new advancements. Now there's new things that we're not even ready to talk about, like the impacts of AI in there and more. Uh, so I, I think I really yeah. appreciate the conversations. And I think these are the kind of conversations that we in the industry, whether you're a 3PL or a provider, need to continue to have because it's going to change faster. You know, and it's funny when I when I started here 22 years ago and somebody says, oh, what does Fosic do? And I said, oh, we ship packages. And I'm like, how hard could that be? Right. How hard is it to ship a box to ships? And, you know, where where we've come in 22 years and even where we're going in the next 10, 15 years, it's just amazing how how everything has evolved. Right. And it's not that it's not hard to ship a box, but it's what goes into it. The people, the planning, the uh you know, the postage, the packaging, the customer service, it's just, you know, that whole, it's a whole big process and it's great to be a part of it. And it's great to watch clients grow and, and through their growth and go through their pains with them. If there are some, when there are some, um, you know, just to be a part of that, to that family that you're building. So um, definitely, and um, you know, great, please. And thanks uh, SPS for putting this together and, you know, and honing in on where where the future is in 3PLs and uh, in this business. That's great, Kelly. Appreciate that. I, I'd, I'd echo all of it, right? And for our listeners, I'm not sure how often uh, they realize that, you know, the three of us don't get to really talk about this too much in a collaborative setting. So it's really refreshing for me, at least, that you kind of kind of share and, and have uh, echoed some of the, the same similarities and thought processes and so forth. I think it also speaks to one thing that just kind of dawned on me as well is that, uh, and, and forgive me, Jack, I'm not sure your, your tenure, but 
you know, Kelly and I, from our company's perspective, 1965, both of them, you know, uh, you know, family owned still in an industry that continues to consolidate and, uh, you know, have an influx of, you know, PE and, and outside large investments. You've got two 3PLs on the panel right now that have, you know, made it through every single change and, and, uh, and pivot that, you know, an industry could possibly go through, including COVID. So, uh, kudos to the SBS team for for finding both of us and putting us on the same conversation. Yeah. That was the criteria, Scott. It was actually <laughs> we founded in 1965. There was three that showed up, and you were our two favorites. So, <laughs> I, uh, good, good. You guys may not know this, but I actually founded one in 1965. So I was the third <laughs> one. <laughs> it's got the age comment. Thank you. I've, I've aged well. So. <laughs> Excellent. So, all right. So I know we've got some, some questions that have come in as well. So I'm going to, we're going to bring Wes back on and uh, Wes is going to facilitate the Q and A from the attendees. And then, uh, you know, some, some parting thoughts and, and, and wrap on the, on the webinar. Yeah. Thanks Tony. And uh, thanks to the panelists. Uh, just a fantastic conversation. So like, like Tony said, we have a few questions, so let's dive right into those and it is not too late to submit a question. So if there's something on your mind, uh, we do have some time um, if we can get through some of these questions to answer some more. So feel free to throw yours in there. The The first one, I think, Jack, this is primarily directed to you. Um, I think based on an earlier comment about, you know, picking a tier one WMS that's flexible, um, they asked specifically, is tier, tier three software a viable choice to look at now and then and maybe even into the future? Or well, what's your perspective on that, Jack? Yeah, and I think it's important. Uh, one, tier one software is great. J group, Fosic fulfillment, right there in the right fit. But you know, as you grow, you're going to have to make business decisions on where and when you invest. And you're going to need a WMS from the time you start all the way through. You may not be able to bring on a tier one at your size. I, I think it's most important as you look at this, and, and Scott Kelly, if you guys have anything else that you would add to this, please jump in. But as you look, you need to look at what's our growth strategy right now? When I look at the technology, when I when I go through a selection process, because to give a short answer, yes, tier three is viable based on your needs. You have to understand and match the technology to what you need. What I would always advise on this end is pick the technology you need for right now, and then the technology that you think will be able to support the next five to seven years. That's really the the, the minimum time you want to be on in on one of these. And and I'm actually going to address Cammy's question that she added in there too, because I think the key here is, you know, Scott and Kelly and I've talked about this. You don't know everything in there. So partner with somebody, lean on a partner, lean on an industry advisor, you know, go with a consulting firm, work with somebody who's been through this and can help guide you through this process because there are many diff different WMSs out there. And you really need to understand before going into a selection, what are your business goals? What are your success criteria? And then really lean in on those because if you go in blind to it, it's, it's really challenging, but tier threes are perfectly viable. And sometimes it may mean that you need to be on it a shorter window, but that's what your business needs to do to attract new customers, retain customers and incentivize. But I would recommend not trying to select frequently. So select for that five to seven years it may be a little bit more costly at the beginning than you're ready to do, but it's less costly than transitioning technologies every two to four years there as well. Scott, Kelly, anything you guys would add to that? Uh, no, no I, I, th I think you answered it perfectly. Yeah, I agree. The only thing I could tell you, I could speak to kind of our journey, if that would be helpful on that. And I think, Jack, you kind of nailed it. J Group took a bit of a different approach at the time when we had made our investment in our tier one WMS it probably would have been unheard of for a company of our size to have made, have made such a large investment in the tier one that we had gone with. Uh, but I also think we ended up gaining those, those investments back uh, as, you know, our business, our customer's business shifted. So I don't think there's any one right approach, but I would tend to agree with Jack in that, um, you know, get what you you need for the for the moment, and that can sustain you for the next. You know, I think you said five years. I think that's the. I think that would be the right approach, uh, and see then where you know your business starts to shift and grow. But I would evaluate in year three. 
And, and Jack, not to put you on the spot, but just for anybody that's listening in on this conversation who's maybe unfamiliar with the tiers uh, of WMS, do you, do you have any guidance on what makes up a one, two, three, or generally speaking, what those refer to? Yeah, it's typically the 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 when we look at that, it, it, tier ones, tier twos, and tier threes pretty much align to SMB, middle market, and enterprise is the different market analysts look. Typically, tier ones are servicing businesses who are uh, 500 million, 750 million in annual revenue and above there. They do have offerings that move down. Tier two really services that 50 million to about 500 to a billion range. And there's a lot of overlap. And one of the challenges when you define tier one, tier two, tier three is a lot of people are going to have different definitions just as SMB, middle market and enterprise. Um, and then SMB is uh, typically those businesses below 50 to 100 million in annual revenue. They're, they're really fit for purpose around a lot of those. As you look to a way to think about it is um, there are great technologies that are really designed for the stage of business that you're in. What you need to understand as a business is how long are you going to remain in that stage? And am I buying for right now? Or am I buying for the next five years, seven years, 10 years? So if you're early in that stage, um, there are phenomenal solutions out there. And, and I don't think there's any one solution that's right for everybody whether it's one tier one solution, tier two or tier three, really depends on what your business needs. Um, and, and I think though, as you look at that, it is kind of a complicated ecosystem to go through. So lean on your other trusted partners, whether they're technology partners, whether they're consulting partners, whether it's a mentor or another 3PL who you've got a friendly non-competitive relationship with. I know there's not a lot of sharing with them, but I, I would lean on on those different pieces and then look at uh, analysts, Gartner, Forrester, you know, Digital Commerce 360. Um, I think that's really critical, but going into that search, um, you're going to find those three typical bands. They typically rely on where, what size businesses are they really built for and built for intent. Yeah. Thanks for that clarity, Jack. Yep. Um, so another question you you touched on a little, and, and this one's for everyone. So maybe we'll start with Kelly and Scott. Um, what, what's a piece of advice you would share with someone who is just starting the process of a, a WMS search or evaluation? Kelly, maybe we'll start with you. Well, I think, you know, you should try to speak to peers and see what other peers are, what you're, what they're doing, um, what, and, and identify what's important to your business, to your growth, um, you know, and what those WMS have to offer, um, really just kind of, you know, even when our WMS search, we were looking at a couple different, uh, different, uh, programs or, uh, projects here and, you know, it just, it took a while. It's, it, it's not a, it's not a, it doesn't have to be a quick process. Um, it was a, quite a long process for us to determine and decide who to finally pick and go with. But again, it was based on um, what we thought we, where we needed to be, what the growth potential was for the future. And then, um, you know, what our clients look for and what was important to them and for us to turn around and, and be able to provide. Yeah, great point. I, 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 uh, Jack touched on a lot of this and Kelly, I think you just reinforced it. Um, start with your customer, right? Understand what, what are the, the reasonable requests you would think that you would be getting from them? Follow that order all the way through, kind of, you know, envision it through all the way to the end, you know, from receiving that product to managing that inventory. If it's managed for D2C, is it managed for B2B? Is it managed at the case level, at the unit level, at the inner case level? Uh, at the pilot level and so forth, uh, and then you know, kind of arrive back at you know what are the what are the core offerings that the WMS out of the box can offer, and then how flexible, which was one of Jack's key words this whole time, uh, are they to to add on and to to pivot right with different requests that you you might assume would come your way. Yeah, and I think. If I would add on, I couldn't agree more with Scott and Kelly, but the last thing that I would add and touch on, so Scott and Kelly have touched on, what are your customers asking for? You know, what are your key goals? What do you need from a software perspective? One area I would always say too is transparently WMS implementation and WMS investment is not to be taken lightly. You need to make sure that your company's on board. You look at what is the change management going to look like? Who's going to project management? What is the transformation? How do we get the business requirements together? Um, there are companies out there who help support those initiatives. If you don't have that experience, 
you can hire somebody in who's been through that transition and really prepare for that. But preparing for a, a, a transition, preparing for an implementation like this uh, is really important. And that preparation includes, like we talked about, business requirements, key success criteria, putting those together because there, as we've said, there's a ton of different WMSs and they're all really, really strong in certain areas. What's key for you is finding the one that's meeting your needs the closest. And, and, and that might not be the largest, it might not be the smallest, but there are those that are gonna fit the exact needs that your customers are bringing to you. And that's where I would lean at. That's a, that's a great point. I've been with other comp, com, uh, companies prior to my experience here at J Group. I can tell you with confidence that discipline is required. So much work is done on the front end to identify the right WMN, WMS partner. And then everyone's like, oh, my work is done here. Right. I, I would encourage discipline. I'd encourage a steering committee that is, you know, you know, um, you know, following it all the way through from the beginning to the end, because it's not something to take lightly. Um, you want to have a pulse. You want to have a finger on it. Um, you know, weeks turn or days turn into weeks, weeks turn into months. And, um, you know, you want you want to make sure that somebody is, is driving that. Jack's probably seen it more firsthand. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. Thank, thank you all for that. So I think that with that, our time is up. Um, so that'll be the, the end of the conversation for today. Thank you, Kelly, Scott, Jack, and Tony for uh, just a great session, a lot, ton of useful content. Um, so I really hope you took something away from today's discussion. Um, watch your email for um, uh, an email from SPS uh, with a summary of today's conversation and an invitation to take a short survey. You're welcome to see the uh, grab the QR code off this screen if that's easier, that'll take you to that survey as well. Um, and then, um, sorry, my video tracked off there. Um, so yeah, use that QR code and, um, sorry, I lost my screen here. Um, and then if you'd like to hear more from SPS um, and, and kind of how we fit into what you, we've discussed today, please reach out to me. Um, to learn about SPS for 3PLs. My contact information is on the screen. Happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thanks again for joining us and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.